not about medication. It was sort of like, let's throw the spaghetti noodle on the wall, see what sticks. And it was, I remember telling patients, yeah, it will probably take a few tries before you find something that's actually going to be helpful without giving you horrific side effects. And even when people were considered psychiatrically stable, and this was a sad thing, they would be on a high dose of some medication and, or usually a cocktail, and they would feel, people would describe to me, I feel like I'm in a straight jacket. So the quality of life of people is usually quite greatly compromised. And the pink elephant in psychiatry is that there's a huge non-compliance issue. If people benefited from these medications, why would they want to get off of them? And then the other piece that comes with it is I have been in many meetings with psychiatrists where they are upping the dose or changing the dose or starting initiating a new one. And that informed consent of fully people understanding what they're getting into usually is very minimized and glossed over and not informed fully what the risks are associated with this. Oh yeah, you're going to have some GI issues. This is well tolerated. It's safe for most people very quick, very glossed over. And I always question if people fully understood the potential harm that comes with these medications, like permanent side effects, would they really be willing to take a chance? Nazareth, I want to get into the mindset of a psychiatrist a bit. Your experience is very similar to mine. Uh, The only way I'm going to communicate it maybe a little bit differently was the perceived benefits tended to be things around maybe feeling a bit sedated or emotionally numb or detached. And in psychiatry, that was always a perceived benefit or viewed as stability. And I can understand if someone is in an acute crisis or maybe severe emotional agitation or anxiety, that that sedative effect can be perceived as therapeutic, at least for a short period of time. But that was never really, never addressing the actual problems the person was experiencing. And just the way that drugs work is the individual is going to adapt to them. There's going to build up a degree of tolerance and it's not going to have the same effect. And then you're just on this cycle of more drugs, more drugs, more drugs, just to kind of almost ghost walk your way through life. And you see sometimes, you know, if you ever look at somebody who is on all these drugs, sometimes there's this like blank stare in their eyes, like they've lost all the light or life inside of them. And that was viewed as stability. That was viewed as a positive psychiatric response. But most people that I worked with didn't get something like that. They either, they either worsened or they just didn't feel well at all or nothing really changed in them. And then you see those non-compliance issues. Where I've always struggled is how does the prescribing psychiatrist delude themselves into believing that this is medicinal, that this is helpful, that what they're doing is really working? Because we've all seen what is actually happening. What's going on within the brainwashing that leads them to come to these conclusions and continue to do this work? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's those. I have asked myself those questions over the years because I've had my share of working with many psychiatrists. Um, I worked in the adult system for 10 years and and the adolescent and pediatric population for seven years. And that was the most challenging one. I remember I had an 18 year old client who was sleeping about 16 hours a day and was sitting at a in front of a television at a treatment center where they were drooling while just watching TV. And they were on a high dose of an antipsychotic. And I went to the psychiatrist and I said, this is clearly not working for this young person. Like, how would you feel if you had a child who was 18 years old sitting in front of TV at home drooling? Yeah. I said, this is, this is not okay. This medication needs, this drug needs to be lowered. And, uh, I was told absolutely not. It was always an ego trip as far as I was concerned. And I also feel 
psychiatrists, um, over time I realize they become desensitized to people's suffering when it comes to the effects of these medications, especially the adverse effects, and almost assume that that is an expected thing that they know every medication comes with risk and that there's going to be unwanted effects. And they somehow make peace with this idea that it's okay. I had another client when I was in the adult system that was 49 years old and had lost everything because she was probably on a six or seven or eight medications. And I remember um, benzodiazepine being the problem. She had akathisia, she was suicidal, had no focus whatsoever. And I remember questioning that with a psychiatrist and saying, she does not need to reinstate this medication. This is not helpful to her. And she has lost so much and she's on these, all these different medications. I think this is actually harming her. And I was hauled into a manager's office for that because I was questioning the authority of a psychiatrist. That's and to problem. me, yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Ahead. Your role as a nurse psychiatrist um, is to monitor the reactions to the drugs. And when you're reporting that those reactions are not beneficial, why are they denying your, your role in that process to communicate clearly what's happening to the, the patients? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you're dealing with people's lives. You're dealing with people's brains. They're coming to you, you know, as, as a psychiatric nurse, People share with me the intimate details of their lives, sometimes that they don't share with their own families and close people to them. It's such an incredible privilege to do the work that we do. And there is a huge amount of trust and responsibility. And so, and yes, as my job is to advocate for my clients and they're coming to me and they're saying, I have gained weight, a hundred pounds in a few months. I don't have any energy. I'm told by my psychiatrist to go exercise and eat right. I have no motivation, my um, no energy. I I'm not functioning at work or at school. There's people experience cognitive decline. They experience increased suicidality. There are many different things that come, many different risks that come with being on medication. And we relay that message to the psychiatrist. And sometimes their idea is to up the dose. But you think, well, <laughs> this is, and if the patient wants to come off the medication, then this is part of their illness. And so it's seen as a problem, you know, they're non-compliant, but it's not non-compliance. It is that they are experiencing disruption in their functioning and their mental state because of the medications that they're taking. And that view is never accepted in psychiatry. The medications are never questioned. They'll question the client. They'll question what, you know, their character, but they will never question the medication very rarely. And if they do question the medication, the solution is always, let's stop this one, or let's up this one, and let's start a new one. So that is seen as the end-all, be-all, the answer to everything. Medication reviews are supposed to happen um, regularly. Deprescribing is not a practice that's in psychiatry most of the time. People are put on these medication for months and years and decades and left on it. Not even the opportunity to say, is this actually still necessary? Can we lower the dose and see how that affects the person if it improves their quality of life? Can we see if they can do without it? Can we help them implement alternatives like you were saying earlier? All the things that could be incredibly helpful and soothing to a person. My first job out of undergrad was in a psychiatric hospital. So it was my first exposure to this. I've been open about this on other podcasts before. And I distinctly remember the hierarchy that existed within that system, 
where the psychiatrist was kind of untouchable. And there were nurses and there were counselors. And I was part of a treatment team. I actually got promoted quite early. So I represented the other counselors who were on the floor. And I think I got promoted because I did ask a lot of questions. I was critical. Uh, and I was also very effective. I was a very effective uh, on a psychiatric hospital with kids age f- five to 10. So uh, one of the things that really disrupted a, a unit was when it was behaviorally out of control. And I was 22 years old, 23 years old, just coming out of playing college football. Um, I was really interested into like behaviorism and some of the techniques that I learned during that time to help manage behavior with young kids I've used the rest of my life. And I just had a, a, a real knack of getting kids to, um, to be able to listen and to kind of follow the rules of the unit in a way to kind of connect with them and to motivate them to, to change. I always had control, very structured. So I did get promoted pretty quickly in that system. But what was hor- horrifying was how the members, the, whether they were the nurses, the, the psychiatrists, the social workers, did become desensitized to the negative effects of these drugs. And when you see it with young children, it's just horrifying. Most of the kids were coming from abusive and violent backgrounds. And when I asked those questions, I saw the fear in the eyes of the staff that I was actually questioning the psychiatrist. And Sean knows my personality. I've probably been doing that since I was 13 years old in various capacities. Probably younger, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just something that was natural to me, and I did not care. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't really see, I don't have fear of the authority figure. So I'll call out the authority figure. I, it was just always something in my soul about that. And, um, you know, I saw the reactions like, oh, my God, you know, he's actually stating out loud what we see. That's horrifying. And I saw how really this group of people became so marginalized. I, I, my perception was that they were viewed as less than human. They were experimental, that their quality of life and their purpose was so poor and so low that any drug that can kind of stabilize the aggressive behaviors of the acting out improves their quality of life, regardless of the consequences. Um, and that was very challenging, very difficult for me to, to deal with. I mean, I remember having a lot of sleepless nights as a, as a young man, but I wouldn't be here today on this microphone without that experience. And so I, I do ultimately look at it as a blessing. But unfortunately, that, has not, that wasn't the only experience where I saw that same hierarchy that same blind obedience to authority and the fear of questioning authority, even in the face of injustice. And that's what's always been challenging for me about the human condition, was how we can turn a blind eye to injustice uh, and just surrender to the the medical authority. And I think that's part of the problem in, in Western medicine, in how we have elevated the medical profession to almost godlike status. And now we don't feel like we even had the right to question. And so many parents that I work with today feel like uh, they have to go against their better judgment because the, obviously the medical authority knows much more. And obviously I just came to the conclusion that there's probably not a more dangerous medical professional than a psychiatrist, probably not a more dangerous medical professional than a child psychiatrist. And uh, many of those same people are kind of graduating at the lowest level of their, of their medical school training, unfortunately. They're kind of the worst of our, our medical professionals. And so I do see anyone who participates in that level of injustice and harm to be violating the ethics of their profession to first do no harm. And I see it as criminal behavior, and I'm not afraid to say that. Do you believe, uh, Nezaret, that when I go to that extent, that that's an extreme viewpoint, or or can you understand my perspective? I totally understand your perspective, and the reason is because I worked in pediatrics for seven years, and that was one of the most challenging experiences that I've had. Um, I was in an emergency. So I was doing psych assessments every day and also, deal, you know, interviewing the parents as well as the kids. And then if I needed support, there's the emergency physician, a pediatrician usually, and then the on-call psych and a staff psychiatrist. 
And with children's and youth health, I realized over time that was actually the thing that led me to leave the profession is just seeing that our youth and their parents are in absolute peril. And the answer to what's happening with our kids, um, suicide being the second leading cause of dis um, death for youth between 14 and 24, uh, besides motor vehicle accidents, why are our kids in this situation? And the answer, I have seen kids as young as four years old on multiple ADHD medications, risperidone, which is a serious neuroleptic, and that's given for aggression. So when you're describing to me how you are able to work with these little kids and help them to see things differently and to behave differently, that's a skill. That is compassion. Anybody can prescribe a drug and say, you know, yeah, this person has a behavior problem and this is the way you deal with it and just discharge them. Um, when I worked in Emerge, we also were able to cover the acute care for children. And I had a stint for about six months. And I remember I was being given a tour by my mentor who ended up actually becoming my manager. But I remember him telling me a story about an 11 year old that came to the unit with on 10 different medications and mm. his heart stopped and he had to be rushed to ICU. So how do you go to the parents and say, yeah, no, your idiot child psychiatrist put your kid on 11 different medications. And of course, parents have abdicated their responsibility these days. And yes, that blind trust of authority two mental health professionals. I recently watched an interview of Abigail Schreier and Jordan Peterson on her book, um, Bad Therapy. And that's what they talk about, that previously people, parents went to their extended family, to their grandparents, to their community to seek help and support if they had a child who is struggling. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. And now people are fragmented in that there's not all the time extended family close by. People live in different places because of education and work. And so what do parents do? They bring them to emergency. They bring them to a doctor or a psychiatrist. And I've had so many times where a kid comes in, they had just been placed on an SSRI a few weeks earlier. Now they're cutting and they're suicidal when previously that was not a history. And it's not to say there weren't kids that were deeply struggling into substances, um, doing all kinds of things. But I would think we would be more discerning and cautious about putting children on psychiatric drugs on a developing brain. Nowadays, we find out that our brain doesn't even fully develop until our mid-20s. Yes, we have our brain and bodies are incredibly resilient. But these substances, these drugs are tremendous in their impact on children.